um, yes, uh, welcome. This presentation was made in collaboration with um, uh, other members of our team um, that are acknowledged here, and it's um, all CC BY. So whatever is in here uh, should be able to be reused. Hopefully, I did it. I did it right. Okay, so let's dive in. If I can actually, yeah, go. Okay, so we are. Um, they said the title is a challenging the status quo, basically the who, when, and how of scholarly peer review. I assume that if you were attracted by their title, you know what scholarly peer review is. But just in case, uh, <laughs> um, my uh, the, the, the scholarly peer review is that process by which um, research and research output is evaluated by peers. Um, and uh, in that the goal is to make sure that whatever is um, and ends up being disseminated and published um, is uh, sound and uh, rigorous and um, has a certain standard of quality. Now, this is an image that is used very often, to, or I've seen very often, it makes me laugh every time I see it, to define scholarly peer review. Um, and I think it's supposed to show that it is a really difficult process by which the peers are ready to like just shred you apart before you get to that goal of publishing and then eventually, hopefully, advancing in your career. Uh, there's that there too. Uh, but the, the other interesting aspect of this is that um, it's mostly what well, are depicted here, mostly like white, um, more senior researchers. Um, and so I think that there are also there are many embedded messages in this um, in this, um, this in this image uh, used to illustrate peer review. And so I wanted to take a moment to just dive in into some of the problems that we see with peer review um, and some of the consequences. And so this doesn't this list doesn't mean doesn't mean to be comprehensive. And so do please if you get more ideas uh, or more problems that you if you see the current peer review because there are many do add them to the documents, we can discuss them in a minute. So the main one that when I st we started thinking about like what are the issues with peer review that we heard that the most is that there are not enough peer reviewers and that it's just this pool is too small. And so the request of, of reviews are too high and editors just don't know like how to handle. And so the consequences are that peer review takes a long time. And so that delays the dissemination of knowledge. Um, the another consequence might be that peer review is could be rushed and uh, often rushed through. And then uh, I think that unintended, uh, it's kind of like makes the review itself more prone to biases. And we're going to talk about the biases in a minute. Um, uh, so, okay, this is, I should disable Slack, but it's also the only way to share. So I'm going to leave. Um, and then reviewers uh, go unrecognized. So this is, again, not every, pro there are many different ways of doing peer review, um, but the main uh, traditional ways is anonymous. And so the reviewers are not known, but by the editors. And so this process is just, they don't get um, uh, the uh, reward. Um, and I think that a consequence of that, uh, one of the consequences of that is that then only uh, the researchers have the privilege of time and support to engage in these activities that do not directly affect their career advancement um, uh, are um, are like more likely to engage. Um, and so those are the, the folks that decide what knowledge is worth disseminating. Um, you know, on, on the same line, uh, the review pool is very homogeneous um, over many, many dimensions uh, with um, uh, white males from North America and Europe who represent most of the um, identities. It's a little bit hard to measure, but uh, there have been studies. Um, and so those uh, is a relative homogeneous pool of people who decides like what art is worth disseminating. Hey, Leslie, welcome. Uh, sorry, it just popped up in my in my view. Um, and so other problems um, are that it's uh, a, often an opaque process. So it is really hard to assess its integrity. Um, and the expertise um, that, that these like reviewers are selected by editors as experts, but like what does the expertise really mean? And um, we have found, we, we, you know, by hearing like that the expertise is usually defined around like, the prestige and, and uh, often like how much that editor knows um, uh, that reviewer. So like this very kind of also tend to be homogeneous networks of connections. 
Um, and then last but not least in this non-comprehensive list, uh, uh, we have the lack of training. Uh, so there is a very, there is not a formalized training in how to provide constructive peer review. And so researchers are just magically supposed to know how to do it. Um, and that of, of course uh, affects the quality of the reviews and like how, um, uh, like there is a huge disparity um, across reviews and reviewers and, and then the reviews might often be unconstructive. I don't know if that's a word, I think it is, and unhelpful to the authors with comments such as go back to statistics 101 of things like that. Uh, and reviewers, uh, as all human beings, are, have, are bias, have biases and these biases are uh, not always um, uh, challenged. Uh, even I, when I, the few times that I peer reviewed, I uh, very rarely saw any of uh, like kind of any language that would challenge those biases in the guidelines for uh, reviewers. So these are some of the problems that we see um, and, and we care about. Um, you probably have been thinking about 10 others uh, if you are engaged, if you already are in this. So um, I want to take a moment to see if anyone wants to express um, or to talk about them, or maybe they wrote in the, in the document and Katrina can read them. Yeah, we do have a couple in the document, but we'll, um, I'll go ahead and share those while, while people have think of their ideas. Um, there's existing, so one, one problem might be just existing networks are reinforced. And um, I, I put in there, the global voice isn't really heard because it's coming from a select select portion of the, of the globe. If anyone else has any others, you're welcome to unmute and share. And we have spaces for all of this conversation to unfold, but again, this is one of those pause, pause moments. Maybe when I stop sharing the screen, it's gonna be easier to engage, but... Um, so this is just a premises. Um, and I, a pre -review, this is only two slides about pre-review, I promise. And it's just that thinking about these problems, we made it our mission to extend the pool of peer reviewers to groups that are underrepresented in scholarship. And so what does that mean, right? So we are, um, what are the things that we're doing to achieve that goal that is really broad? Um, and we can also start thinking about like what diversity means, but um, just for uh, the sake of time, I'm just gonna touch on a few, um, let's call them interventions that we begin to work on. And I, then I hope that the rest of the conversation can actually shift on what you all think should be um, uh, doing in order to address some of these problems. Uh, so the things that we've been focusing on are, um, in the center here is the from the beginning just building infrastructure to uh, host the community that we want to create and to empower and then the projects on the side are uh, training and mentorship uh, to build um, to build that trust and to get to that problem and the issue of like lack of training and um, that it really includes assessment of biases um, in uh, the peer review process and then uh, running events uh, that um, uh, encourage like collaborative, collabor collaborative evaluation of peer reviews, but also connection between early career researchers and other uh, researchers uh, in this space. And these are, we call them live stream preprint journal clubs. Um, don't want to spend too much time about what we do, but I just want to say that really we see infrastructure because this is a conference about open infrastructure as um, not the answer to the needs uh, directly, but like has a, a place to to gather these global communities um, under like a, a series of like shared needs that we're still trying to understand. And so, okay, this is like the one of the first prompts, uh, the, the second prompt that I guess um, I, I want to bring you all to the discussion. And when we think about some of the, the strategies and the challenging of the status quo, we often, uh, use these questions about like, okay, so who do we think should peer review? Um, because we see that this peer review group is very homogeneous, but like also thinking about beyond just uh, researchers, do we, um, do we think that peer review should actually, who, like, I guess, like, how do we challenge that definition of expertise that is right now um, uh, br brought in uh, to uh, review research? And when should that peer review happen in the life cycle of research? Um, in um, a, a group uh, discussion that I had a, um, a couple of years ago, a lot of when we were thinking about inequities um, in the process, a lot of some folks brought up the idea that, 
of the concept that are actually, uh, if you are an under-resourced lab or institution, um, you tend to have fewer peers around you to actually give you feedback at the beginning when you're proposing the idea. And so like, when, how can we build a structure and, and, pro and programs that can enable that feedback to happen earlier, but in a safe way? Um, and then how, how should that peer review actually happen? Um, again, thinking about constructive uh, feedback, et cetera. So I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna actually stop sharing. Um, we have some more prompts, but I think that this is a good place to stop and take a breath. <laughs> Yeah, and I think if folks aren't in the document, it seems like a, a bunch of people are. Um, but if you aren't, the Daniela posted the link in the JROS 2020 chatter channel in Slack. So if you need it, you can grab it there. Um, but some folks are writing in the document. I don't know if anyone wants to um, read off that what they added in the who, um, when, or what should one review, how should one review. And these are just some questions. Do you have other questions that you want to bring at this point? Please. Yeah. Um, I saw some ways someone raised, uh, how do you recruit reviewers with suitable expertise from far outside your network? I think that's something that is a good, we can, as a group, talk about more. I need to actually go to that because I'm not seeing, <laughs> that's just one second, the document I should be seeing. You need another monitor. Here I am. Okay. Yeah. So I see the, the questions. Which one did you just read out, Georgia? Loud. I just read it's a question that was put into the top section of questions and comments that come up during the slide share. So it's a question okay. that was posed while you were presenting. How do we recruit reviewers? Um, is the person who wrote the question and want to uh, add some comments to that? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's me. Um, yeah, so I suppose the broader question is um, how do you? Uh, how do you expand your network whilst s avoiding reviewers who are not going to do a good job of reviewing the article, like who aren't going to... Um, so I suppose you can sort of fish up names on the internet or use some sort of um, process based on, on Web of Science or PubMed Commons or whatever, but it's, it's often a very long shot if you pick a yeah. bunch of names and hopefully someone will agree and hopefully some of them will do a good job of the review process. Are you an editor? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've sat in on a lot of peer review. Yeah. Thousands we just sent out a, um, a survey to editors, and uh, I'm hearing a lot of that concern. Yeah. Does anyone you, have, uh, yeah, I'm just curious if anyone in the group has had a particularly good experience, either being reached out to or, um, or having experience finding people that they that weren't the sort of traditional path or if anything anyone wants to share in response to that question <laughs> i was like i know pre-review has ideas oh. but i'm curious yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh my god we thought about that yeah. yeah, it is a difficult, it is a, this definitely a difficult one. Um, and what it is, uh, the counter to that though, is um, that again, the way how, it is a difficult um, task, but like the way how now reviewers are found is, is and please me, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, is uh, I'm hearing a lot, it's just like, okay, I know that person and so I trust them. And so I'm gonna like send them that review because I know they're gonna do a good job. and. And that's what we all would do. I have that, you know, bias for everything that I do. But um, so, like, I think what's needed here is a process by which we can build a trust around um, a definition of expertise that kind of transcends this, like, oh, the editor knows the reviewer, uh, and so give, exposes and gives visibility to uh, new voices and expertise uh, that are currently like not visible. Um, so, like, the question is, how do we do that? Which is something that we can ask of ourselves. Um, I can say some of the things that we're doing, <laughs> but uh, uh, so for instance, we think that this mentoring program that we are just piloting right now, we are uh, pairing um, early career researchers um, who are come up uh, with like very little experience in peer review with experienced reviewers. 
and go through um, a, a series of, it's like a cohort based programs, it's interactive, and they go through, um, they write reviews with their mentors, but the, the other part of the program is that we also teach um, or teach, we learn together how um, biases might creep in uh, into the process of peer review, and we really emphasize this constructiveness uh, in the feedback. Um, and how system of oppression might manifest into the peer review process. And the idea is that then we generate a pool of reviewers who are willing to come and review and are building their um, uh, profile by reviewing uh, openly, uh, reviewing preprints. So that is kind of a process that is outside of the journal organized peer review. Um, and then uh, they will contribute to a database that is shared with editors uh, to then like kind of um, have access to reviewers who are willing to, who have been trained, who are willing to participate and who have reviews that are published online of preprints that can kind of testify to their expertise. Um, we just started, we have 10 review, uh, 10 early career researchers and 50% of them uh, are underrepresented minorities um, according to the NSF definition, which is very North American centered because that's what we are focusing on in terms of for this pilot. Um, so Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans um, for this first pilot. But the idea is that we want to take this and um, help partner with others to kind of um, build um, kind of, um, I guess, a context appropriate um, uh, versions of this program. So this is our, <laughs> we're trying to do, of course, it's like, you know, it needs to get bigger to affect the problem, but. Yeah, and just to build on that, I think also the idea of working in the open is a way to change this, right? Like the general idea of the platform in that case is also people can be doing reviews in the open. And so folks who are editors or are looking for reviewers or whatever <laughs> the um, process, whatever is the reason you might be looking for folks, there's uh, a body of work and people can build profiles and also say like, Hey, I'm here to review. I'm happy to do it. Here's like proof of my work. Also, Although, so, I'll, um, I'll say as someone that has now been in academia for long enough to have received so many review requests, like I almost, I, I, you know, I tried not to be found to be a peer reviewer because I already, <laughs> I already received way more review requests than I can already take. And when they ask you, you know, who would you recommend to review? I'm always loath to recommend any of my colleagues who I know would be good at reviewing it because I don't want to add to their workload. And it's just like, oh, I know that they'll feel guilty turning it down just as I feel guilty turning it down. Um, so there's there's two, and I think there is a number of people who are seeking to be reviewers because they are starting and it's a way of sort of getting to know the field and reading and having that opportunity. And then there's people that are a little more like in the middle of their careers who are later in their careers who, for whom reviewing is like I, I do a good amount of it, but it, there's also, I already have more than I can handle in terms of. Um, uh, That's why we need to expand that. So not everybody's gonna ask yeah. Juan Pablo to do it. <laughs> um, is there, so I see a lot of, of writing of things that are happening here. Uh, we have a couple of more, uh, more prompts, but I, I guess like my, another thing that I've been thinking about is like, um, when we think about disciplines, so when we think about expertise, and uh, I'd love to hear from editors that are here, we, you might think about, for instance, asking a reviewer who has been in that field for a long time. So when I was a student, uh, published a neuroscience paper, my paper was reviewed by two neuroscientists who have worked in that same exact model and um, same exact like brain area. Uh, however, I had um, I used the Bayesian model statistics and none of the authors were statisticians. So I would have loved to have comments from a statistician, but you know, that kind of expertise was not recognized as needed. Um, and so I think that there was, there were definitely issues with the statistics, but nev none of the reviewers brought it up. So for instance, how can we enable um, a situation in which peer review, um, by crowdsourcing and making it more open and available, like, you know, pre-publication to um, different communities. How can we leverage expertise that might not be directly linked to that specific field? Um, and so that's kind of like something I've been thinking about when we think about like the who question. The, yeah. can, can I chip in? 
Um, this is Dario's hand. Yeah, Pat Team and Cameron. Oh, sorry. No. Um, my my impression is that many of the problems that people diagnose with peer review is because the people that are charged with doing the peer review and running the peer review process um, are not uh, don't have time to learn how to to do it or are not doing it particularly well. That is, editors who, when presented with a manuscript, put the same five names in every single time. They just don't, they're not thinking about what they're doing. So the journal I used to work on, Molecular Ecology, was blessed with uh, 20 or so exceptionally good editors. And they they ran an exceptionally good peer review process. They, they selected uh, subject matter experts, method experts from among their reviewers and and everybody contributed a lot of time. And I thought we did a really great process. Um, now I work in a medical journal, I can see what people are complaining about because you get this one sentence review. People do it, you know, they do a review in less time than they could have possibly read the article, like five minutes between agreeing and completing review. It's impossible to review it that quickly. And and so clearly the system as a whole, there's just not enough people who are great at peer review, either as reviewers or editors or whatever, that we need to build systems that do a great job instead, um, uh, that take away that labor. Things like uh, reviewer selection tools that are mm -hmm. able to view the, the landscape as a whole and pick out reviewers who aren't necessarily known to the editors and and recommend them instead and, and so on. So yeah, this is, this is problem. Right. Dario? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I wanted to uh, riff off the uh, suggestion you were making about having more diverse roles uh, for, for reviewers. It strikes me that, um, and also based on what Tim was saying, right? Like our experience as, as reviewers becomes, over time has become like, a, oh my God, it's a crazy daunting task we have no time. The volume of submissions overall is growing. And so there's like a, a fixed population of roughly of people can peer review and more and more content available. How can you do this? In a situation where if you accept being a reviewer, then you need to be the expert of every single aspect of a, of a paper, even if you're not qualified to review some aspects of it. So I really like to think that you know, the, the work you're doing with peer review, instead of getting people to learn about this, like a, a suboptimal system that is not scaling, is just not working, is so affected by so many problems. The idea of embracing the notion of, uh, of roles uh, in the open and having more it's like a, a targeted and modular types of reviews where somebody may say, hey, I'm an expert of Bayesian methods and I don't know anything about the domain specificity of, uh, of the work you're doing, but I'm happy to lend my expertise in reviewing the, uh, the uh, statistical analysis section and, and seeing if that's something um, that could, uh, at the same time, uh, solve for the, uh, uh, the uh, inefficiencies of the, pro of the process, but also uh, reduce some of the bias because uh, you will not be forcing people to pretend they have an expertise to cover all the aspects uh, of a uh, of, of, a, of a traditional review, but uh, allow them to grow into where those areas where they feel confident and then can build um, more of a reputation for being good at that specific type of reviews. Just curious if you've uh, experimented with this notion of a rubric in, in specific review roles uh, in the context of review. Of review, review. Yeah. So we definitely thought that we have, uh, as we're rolling out a new platform, thinking about some of the tools that can enable that behavior um, with the uh, author-driven requests. So where the authors, well, I'm not sure when they will roll out, but like the author can actually drive the attention uh, to um, specific parts they might want. So like I was, again, using myself as a use case, which is, you know, I know one, but like I, I when, if I had some that for print uh, at that time, I would have, uh, drove the attention of like a statistic, a Bayesian statistician there. And so if then the platform can, someone has that tag in their profile, they can be, you know, brought to, um, to, to check, check like to the attention of, of, of my preprint. Um, the, we haven't, uh, we, the, the closest we have come to test that is with like preprint journal clubs. 
um, in which we have organized uh, this like journal closet run for prints in which everybody um, kind of comes and, and um, not everybody, but <laughs> folks that we that could, that get to know that there is a journal club coming um, from different parts of the world come and, and, and kind of comment. And it was really amazing to see um, how different expertise uh, actually made up the review that was much richer than if just one person had done it. I think building on that, you could adopt a model that's similar to what's going on with authorship and contributorship um, on the authoring side, where you have people claiming roles for software, for code, for the writing, analysis, and you could have that on the reviewer side too. So the two things end up kind of dovetailed and matched when people want to claim those roles in, in these different venues. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I just have been adding and would invite others to, we had the second session, um, uh, and we, I think we have about 20, do we go to 10 after or do we? we have 15 minutes and we have until, uh, okay. I'd love to go to the next part. Um, uh, yeah, I would say knowing we only have about 15 minutes left, um, one of the, what we had been thinking was to have folks help. Um, we have a couple more prompts around like what people have, uh, personally experienced related to, um, systems of oppression in this context. Um, ideas people have, and we were going to try and um, have a conversation about a few of those. I've been trying to just document as people have been talking about some. So uh, those have been really great. And maybe we actually can just keep brainstorming as a group. Um, and I, yeah, if that makes sense, or like talk about the other piece there is to identify barriers to making any of these types of changes to the process. Um, just I do out. want to really get to the next point about system oppression still before we get there so we don't lose that key part of the breakout. But Leslie, please, you had uh, your hand up. So oh, I, I remember a, a story I heard on uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, uh, uh, a few months ago about this climate scientist from Canada who was studying Arctic weather patterns and, and changes in climate for the last 30 years. And he was uh, finishing up a paper, and one night he sat down uh, with an elders from one of the communities that he was living or staying at, um, and and he said that in the la in the uh, half hour he sat down listening to the stories from the elders, and his understanding of climate change have given him more understanding of the environment than he had in the last you know, many years right, and insights in, that he have never thought about. Uh, and so if there are a peer that could have reviewed his paper much better than a lot of his scientific colleagues, this indigenous elder would have been a much better advisors to his work than anybody. But in the context of his work, he, he, this person would never be on the radar screen, right? And I think this kind of story, re I, I encounter over and over again with people I work with in different communities in different parts of the world, and that these knowledge holders and communities with which we study, or that we study, uh, they're, they're the one that knows better their lived experience than most of the people that come to the community. And we can continue to ignore them as, as if they, they don't matter, right? And other people somehow in the system that could be found electronically uh, become the peers. So I, I think we need to rethink what constitute peer uh, in the first place. And, and I think if we, if we are able to, to rethink that, I think there could be a, a lot of different possibilities. Thank you for, for that. And, uh, and that is one of the main uh, challenge and thought that kind of, I mean, not exactly what you said, because I didn't know that story, but that's, um, it's what comes to mind when I hear that AI will solve this, because by building this, if we build an AI system, I'm pretty sure that the metrics, that the, the, the tags or the keywords that we would use to match uh, reviews with reviewers, are probably going to be around the same metrics that we are using right now, which are, you know, around prestige and um, uh, previous participation. Um, and but but also like, even if we could do that in a better way, um, and like the example you just brought up, I don't I don't want to I don't want to assume, but I, I presume that it would be harder for an el an elderly person of that group to 
engage in a platform with a new tool like so like even just like how do we capture that knowledge um needs to be rethought and and so i um i wonder if you if you have like i feel like the, the technology in here yeah, that while we try to use that we think about trying to use technology to lower barriers actually they could be a they can increase the barriers for certain communities to come in um and so i wonder like what do you if, if there are any ideas on how like a possible strategy or to actually bring in these voices in a context that is not necessarily here is that you log in through an orchid id and <laughs> which is what we have on preview yeah so i think that the closest we've got and again it's 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 through this like conversations like this one, but I, but probably even you know getting uh, some of the communities to a, to a Zoom call. I, I don't know. Like I'm just I'm just assuming that it's more of a barrier than it would be. Oh my gosh, ten minutes. Um, but this is actually the key question, so I'm happy to. Um, I, I would be like I'm gonna share again my screen and go to the next other slide, and I think that that. Well, we had another hand. Um, oh, we did. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hi, Chris. Please, I'm here. Here you are. That's okay. Let's Is move on. Was it? was it mine? No, 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 no. I want to hear it. Please. Well, I think, I think Leslie's example is a good one. And there's uh, and you're right, uh, probably there's a technological barrier there, but it goes beyond maybe um, familiarity with the equipment. I mean, there's no internet in the Arctic. So if you're speaking to an Inuit or Dene elder, they might not have internet, even if they've got a computer, they might not be able to connect. So there's, I mean, I guess it's an appropriate thing to talk about at an infrastructure conference, but uh, there's, there's layers of the system that that are barriers to uh, uh, what would be a richer participation and and a better result. That's all. I wonder, no, I was just thinking about that and thinking about um, one thing I wrote down in the ideas is are there ways that we could actually shift have the review process happen through different types of methods and formats like. I mean, Danielle mentioned journal clubs and we're talking about sort of inviting more people openly to the process in general. Um, but to the idea of like, if you know, if you're talking about a climate piece or specifically something about the Arctic, like maybe you should be, you should have to have something in the Arctic with people who live there and like talk about the, the work, right? How do we do that in a way that um, we bring things to the context that they're about? Um, I think could be really interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has done something like that before or seen that done before, but um, in the same way that we hold public meetings about changes to uh, the places that we live, right? <laughs> Maybe the research should be brought, brought to the places, yeah. I hope the point I was making was, I think that technologies kind of tends to be the obvious barrier, but actually is how you define certain you know, norms and characteristics that is really the, the challenge here. So who is yeah. your peer, who constitute peer is something that, you know, it's hard, very, very, very contextual and cultural and political. I remember some Brazilian colleague told me that if the your peer review for a Brazilian journal is not considered uh, uh, peer review in the same way as you peer review for an international journal. So, uh, and, and so, there are all these 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 socially imposed criteria that intermix with the technological barriers, and we often get them conflated. And I think the point I'm hoping to make is, you know, we, we need to separate some of these, these issues. Yeah, I think that ties up well with what I was going to show next. Um, so let me just continue to share. And this is, so this is uh, uh, some content that uh, Antoinette Foster, the project manager of um, uh, the Open Reviewers Program, which is a mentorship program I kind of mentioned, uh, started developing. And uh, so we started thinking about like, how do system of oppressions manifest in peer review? Because they do. Um, and so in that, to answer that question, um, 
we just want to define uh, what system oppressions are, discriminatory institutions, structures and norms, policies and practices embedded in our society used to oppress groups of people. These are all the ism, um, and uh, these are not all of them, but some of them. Uh, there are definitely more uh, that we could fit in a slide. Uh, that and and like I feel like starting thinking about how some of these even uh, system of oppressions manifest in peer review is a very powerful kind of like a starting point to uh, start tackling uh, and, and thinking about strategies of in solutions. Um, and one other aspect that uh, I think it's helpful, uh, we think it's helpful to, to think about if we take racism, for instance, um, is that very often we think about the personal interpersonal racism and how like a person is a racist and how we need to move away from that. But anyway, that's another piece of conversation. But the 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 way how racism uh, manifests in peer review is a much bigger and um, problem that kind of uh, goes through the institutional and structural so like they all like just think about policies uh, practices um so it's we with the training program we're thinking about trying to like work out the uh, how racism might manifest and like in my peer review process my experience and maybe like the experience that the conversation i have with the editor and the author but um we are operating within a structure that is like defined by white supremacists and uh, has a big racist problem. So like, how how do we move through this, um, different scales and move out pro uh, problem solving? And um, I guess like I wanted, we wanted to open up about like how, if you have like, some experiences about how racist might play a role in peer review, I think we had some examples that were brought up. And here is just like, we picked two examples about colonialism and white supremacy and defining uh, what they are and how they mani manifest in the scientific enterprise because the program we're running is for the life sciences. Uh, and so I think Leslie just mentioned uh, a couple uh, where, for instance, the colonialism, like the system or policies of a nation seeking to extend or retain its authority over other people and territories. So then it reflects on, you know, the problem that Juan Paolo also have studied um, in much more depth with his lab um, that were the nations that public more, who in terms of white supremacy, who makes the majority of the decisions, um, and what do uh, the environments uh, you find yourself uh, look like that are very uh, homogeneous. So I think, again, like we um, thinking about um, the some of these aspects when we think about like intervention, um, it's, it's helpful. And I just wanted to open it up um, maybe again to the discussions if you anyone else wants to um, express some comments around like how they think some of these um, systems of oppression manifest in peer review and if there are any possible ideas on how we start tackling those issues. Alex, just before you do, I'll just give you the three minute warning here. So just yeah. whoever go. comments, keep them brief. I'll be very brief. Um, so, so most of my experience has been in sort of the computer science domain. Um, and a lot of that is not necessarily in, in journals per se, but often in peer review for conferences. But two things, um, one is often, uh, one is more uh, explicit in, in identifying and reviewing people based on the language that they use. Um, and oftentimes people for whom the, the primary language is not the language that's being written in. Um, and that becomes an excuse for, for poor reviews or even uh, like outright dismissal. The other is, is much more um, insidious, I think, and it's oftentimes scoped in the, the either the um, editorial boundaries of the journal or what's considered canon in the field and not allowing uh, or sort of rejecting papers outright saying it's a good paper, but it's not, it's not part of this field. And so it, it's not inviting to sort of broader thinking around some of the same problem areas. This may be more specific in computer science because it's more methods based than domain based, but uh, those are two that I encountered. One idea that I was just thinking about while we've been talking is um, I wonder if there could even just be value in there being folks who are open to having to being contacted to help figure out how to change how you're approaching review process. Like if we, um, I mean, we've all been talking, I feel like everyone who's come to this session, <laughs> if someone came to you and said, not just who should I get to review this paper, but actually how should I change how I'm reviewing this paper, right? And we could brainstorm about, you know, you should question these methods. You should like, we could, we could have a group that like 
acts as does that as a service i don't know for editors or for authors um but if there's like a way that how do we sort of shift the narrative around a lot of this is kind of what i'm thinking because to the the canon point and um some of the biases we've been talking about like a lot of this is about having these conversations and then having solidarity and challenging them right um so that we can show that there's value in doing that yeah i just want to uh, put a plug at the very end there's a wrap-up session section where you can subscribe to our seasonal um seasonal newsletter coming from pre review and um a slack pre review slack so we can continue this conversation um feel free to to add in your notes or if you'd like to contribute moving forward sorry that we didn't get to everything but um the newsletter is actually going to be really new because we have never we haven't started yet but if you do subscribe at some point next year you'll get some updates but um and uh please do come to the slack we do uh, have this some of these conversations there and yeah sorry we didn't have more time to discuss thank you but for opening thank you so much everybody for coming <laughs> and thanks Juan Pablo for hosting. happy to host yeah but thank you for for uh, helping with this conversation <laughs>